G'day everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Hope everyone is having a wonderful Monday uh, and I'm here today, of course, to talk through the round two uh, action, as it were. Um, I actually got to see a really good amount of footy this weekend, which is great, even though I worked, uh, managed to catch up, didn't watch the Eagles game live, had to watch it after the fact. Um, but either way, very good round of footy, I thought. Some interesting narratives coming out of it, some interesting events that happened, and we're going to talk through all of that in this video. Today is a bit of a symbolically large day for the channel, I guess, in a sense. Uh, last day at Bunnings yesterday, so this is my first day. This is day one, Monday morning, of um, of being a full-time YouTuber for the foreseeable future. I've also sold my bed, which you can't see, but that happened this morning. Uh, I'm a busy boy at the moment, and uh, yeah, things are changing thick and fast. That's not the right choice of words. Anyway, we're going to talk about uh, round two in today's video. The format for the rest of the week uh, will be similar to last week. You will get my Eagles thoughts in a separate video, so I won't talk about this game in this video. Uh, Druzy will do nine things I learned. Uh, we're going to do a podcast this week. You'll get my footy tips this week. And probably going to do a standalone video for the Derby preview coming up on the channel as well. So... Stick around for all of that action and uh, potentially more. We'll see how it go. I've got to sell shit and move out of this place by Friday, but I will be everywhere. Once again, thank you for all the support lately, hitting 20K recently. Um, I did a Q&A podcast last week, uh, TFP97. That's out on the channel uh, and on your audio platforms as well. If you do us a favor as well and um, head to your, your podcast app or whatever, and um, you know, if you can rate the True Footy podcast, that'd be great. Uh, for some reason, we don't score too well on the audio listens, do very well on YouTube. Um, so anything you can do to help us out, if you are an audio listener, that would be great. Much appreciated. While it has been a great period of growth for the channel, it does appear that 42% of the people who have been watching the videos over the last month or so are still not subscribed. My goal is to get that closer to 50-50 at least. So if you could help me out in any way by uh, hitting that subscribe button, much appreciated. Anyway, let's crack into the round that was in round two, which started off with Carlton and Geelong uh, doing battle at the MCG on Thursday night. Did the live stream for this game. Uh, had a few of you join along for the ride, but we'll talk about that game regardless. Obviously, the Blues got it done by eight points, and this is a, a very validating win for them for, for multiple aspects. I think um, knocking off uh, you know the, the premiership favorite, you'd have to say, with Geelong being the best team in the competition over the last 12 months. For them to really notch a big scalp like that is a huge step forward after a deflating draw, I'd say, last week against Richmond. And then on top of that as well, uh, if you look at the last three losses, I think, Carlton, or at least their last three games, there was a draw last week where they kind of let it slip. They had a one-point loss to Carlton in the final round last year. They had a five-point loss to Melbourne at the end of the year. This game was one where it kind of went down to the wire. Admittedly, probably it got closer than it should have from a carbon perspective, but they hung on and they won. And like I said, it's against the big contender. So I think this is a really positive step for the Blues. They've got six points out of a possible eight now against Geelong and Richmond, two sides I expect to feature in September to different extents. They did have to overcome a monstrous Jeremy Cameron. This is one of the best games he's ever played, I think. He had 25 possessions, kicked six goals. Some of the goals he kicked were unreal as well, and you could really see him trying to lift his club on his shoulders as well. And you shudder to think from a Geelong perspective how this game would have gone without Jeremy Cameron in the form he was in. Um, but on the plus side for the Blues as well, at the other end, Kurnow kicked five goals. He was great. Comparatively less impactful than Cameron, but still bagged five goals. Did his job absolutely. Makai, the other key forward, had a quiet game. I think he only had one and probably sub-10 disposals, but really stood up in the last five minutes with a couple of big, big marks. So I thought that was huge for them. The Cats have a few injury woes at the moment. Obviously, Tom Stewart was missing. Uh, Colin Jasney and Henry as well have been injured. So a couple of casualties for them, although... From a depth depth perspective, uh, Geelong, you know they're not they're not a uh, shallow list. That's that's for sure. For the Blues, though, I thought this win was really generated by a very even midfield performance. In particular, Matt Kennedy. I think when the game was there to be won throughout the second and third quarters, he was really prominent. Cripps, Acres, Chera, these guys were all good. Uh, and one guy I really noticed as well was uh, Adam Sard as well. I mean, we know he's a good player, all Australian last year. But in the opening two rounds, I've watched Carlton games start to finish. And uh, you can really see the impact he has with his drive and his um, his dash in particular. I thought the young guys for the Blues actually quite impressed me to different extents. Uh, Ollie Hollins and Jesse Motlop, uh, I think both in their second game. Well, actually, I think Motlop's played a handful now, but both of them impressed me. Uh, Motlop, uh, pretty clean for a young player and uh, put his head over the ball a couple of times as well. And uh, I don't think Hollins will get the rising star nod, but he was also very good um, and composed and 
played as a link-up player for the Blues. So they'll be very, very happy with his progress after two rounds. And then the small forwards as well, Durden and Owies in particular, kicked three goals. They'll be very happy. And from a Geelong perspective, uh, they've had, they're have they 0-2. And I think there's, some, there's a few 0-2 sides out there at the moment where you're thinking, not sure if you can make the finals. We'll talk about those teams more closely in a minute, but Geelong is not one of those sides. I wouldn't be concerned if you're a Cats fan, you know, this time last year, or at least six rounds into last year, they'd lost to Fremantle, they'd lost to Hawthorne. Admittedly, Fremantle went on to be a good side, but they didn't look anything like Premiership standard. So it's a long season and it's a marathon. I still have faith in Geelong. Then on Friday night, we had a big clash um, that sort of lived up to expectation. It was certainly a talked about game between Brisbane and Melbourne, where the Lions got the job done by 11 points up at the Gabba. Obviously, much was said about the lights going out, uh, which sort of brought about a weird shift in momentum where Melbourne kicked like five late goals, nearly stole the game. But I thought Brisbane were pretty much commanding throughout the contest, uh, two good sides at it. And with stark contrast to a pretty listless performance in round one from the Lions, they look much more like the side we were expecting to see in uh, in large periods of this game. Brisbane were threatening to blow out the the contest and perhaps the lights going out um, came at a good time for Melbourne to sort of recoup the damage a little bit. But Brisbane, to be fair, deserved to win this game. We saw strong midfield performances from Josh Dunkley. He had 26 disposals and 9 clearances, and then Neil was typically productive with 27 and 8 clearances as well. So those guys really got the job done in the center, and they were well supported by Ashcroft, who probably will get the rising star. By the time this video comes out, it's probably going to be announced. But he had 31 disposals, kicked a goal, and impressively, yes, he he threw it on the boot a few times as well, but half his possessions were contested as well, which is great for a young 18-year-old midfielder in what was a, a tough midfield to come up against. And of course, Clayton Oliver was huge as he always was or always is rather he had 37 disposals and a goal I thought Ben Brown did a really good job as a key forward kicked four goals and some of them were really impressive goals as well I think there was that really clever snap um, I think the tools at both ends were good Danaher obviously kicked four himself Charlie Cameron was also quite productive in this game if you just look at the stats and he had two goals and 12 touches but I thought his impact um, extended beyond that as well so it was a good game where a lot of the guns were firing and a hugely important win for the Lions had they dropped this game and gone 0-2 I would have still had faith that they'd make the finals, but obviously if you're pushing for that top four, this was a really, really important game for them. So well done to the Lions. They look much closer to the side we were expecting, as I said earlier. So the third big game of this round, um, and they happened in order, funnily enough, was Collingwood versus Port Adelaide. We expected a great contest. I know I certainly did. I've been talking up Port Adelaide uh, because I think there's a huge amount of potential there. But Collingwood's come out and made a huge statement that they're arguably the um, the the standard at the moment in the competition with a massive 71-point win over the power at the MCG. Is there anyone in the comp better than Richmond right now? Doesn't matter. It's only round two. Probably doesn't matter. But I think Collingwood at the moment are looking really, really red hot. They're making me look a little bit silly for having them outside the top four. But again, it's a top, it's a long season, long way to go. So both of these sides went into this game after a really, really impressive round one, and Collingwood just looked so much better than Port Adelaide. They just dominated the clearances, they dominated contested possessions, and on top of that, they were much more efficient inside 50. I think there was only 10 more inside 50s than the power, but kicked 12 or won the game by 12 goals. There's a bit of a talk about Nick Dacos being a Brownlow chance this year, and what an achievement that would be. Uh, I think there's a good chance that he will get the three votes for this game. He had 32 possessions and kicked two really good goals as well. So by contrast, the power looked a little bit overwhelmed. No one on that side had more than 21 possessions. Uh, and they weren't quite up to it. But it is early days. Sometimes a a reality check like that can actually be a good thing for a side. And uh, losing to Collingwood away is one that they can sort of learn from and move on from. So I don't think necessarily they've been exposed. I think they would just come up against a really strong side in Collingwood and that they've shown what the standard is and what can happen if you're having an off day. So Port Adelaide can shrug this off, um, but geez, Collingwood look impressive. The next game was Adelaide versus Richmond, and uh, I watched this game live, and you can see that Adelaide fans will be frustrated with this, uh, with maybe not the result, but the way the first two rounds have gone. Obviously, they lost this game by 32 points, and again, it was a tale of two halves. They got down by 45 points uh, in the first half where they just looked outclassed, outplayed by admittedly a very strong Richmond side. But the frustration will come from the fact that in the third quarter, they uh, they flipped the script and started dominating. Couldn't quite put that dominance on the scoreboard. And uh, ultimately, it wasn't enough to win the game. But we're seeing, again, after last week, uh, a really strong first half and a poor finish. They had a poor start this week and a, a really good third term. 
and they couldn't quite uh, hold off a very good side in Richmond. So the Crows fans might feel like there's a little bit left on the table from an Adelaide perspective this year in their two games uh, coming away with no points. Uh, will be a disappointing result considering the preseason optimism that I and many had for them. But again, they are a young side, so I think they can t- treat this as a learning rather than diabolical results or anything. To get 45 points down and come back within one point does show some character, and it shows that they uh, they flicked into gear when they when they needed to, or perhaps a little bit later than they needed to. Um, but either way, some positive signs despite losing the game by five goals. In the third term, they they had 24 inside 50s to seven. Um, and I thought Riley O'Brien was actually really impressive during this period. He was a monster, took some really, really good contested marks as well. Um, and of course, Rory Laird is good. Uh, after a quiet round one, he came back with 39 disposals and a goal. I focused a lot on Adelaide so far in a game that they've lost. Uh, for Richmond, this was a game they, they simply had to win after the last week's relatively disappointing draw. I thought they probably shaded Carlton um, but of course, that game ended with two points apiece. And for them to notch the four points in this game was important. They they steadied, they rallied after Adelaide came at them hard in the third quarter. And ultimately, the better side on the day one. And they did have a bright spark from a youth point of view. Samson Ryan, 206 centimeter forward. Uh, and I think his second game kicked three goals. And they kind of really stretched Adelaide's defense as well. So an important four points for Richmond. And they will move on to round three with six points in the bag out of eight, which is solid going. Hey guys, sorry, I just want to interrupt the video for a couple of moments. Just a question, are you somebody who perhaps has a bench press or other kind of weights at home, but you don't know how to get the most out of them? It's quite likely you have all the equipment that you already need, but you're not quite sure how to make the most of that. Thankfully, there are hundreds of exercises that could be performed using just a simple bench or some dumbbells. It's just a matter of knowing how to do those exercises and following a structured training regime. As a qualified exercise scientist, Druzy can bring your home gym to life, designing a structured program to guarantee results from the comfort of your own home with whatever equipment you may have. So if you're ready to stop making those excuses and you're ready to dust off the dumbbells, it's time to make the most of your home gym. So go to druzysathleteacademy.com or follow the link in the description. Druzy is offering a specific home gym program to those of you who may have your own gym and he can tailor it to the equipment that you specifically have available. Through TrueFooty, you can get 20% off that program by using the code TrueFooty20 at checkout. Thanks guys, let's get back into the video. Then we had uh, possibly the most surprising result, or two surprising results on Saturday night, but we'll talk about the Bulldogs and St Kilda first up. I uh, tipped the Dogs to win this game. I thought they were the stronger side, and St Kilda made a mockery of that prediction, winning this game by 51 points at Marvel Stadium, and it's time to respect them, okay? Uh, I think it's not so much that I disrespected them, but perhaps I... You know, I was a little bit unsure where to place them going into this year. I think their talent is solid without being spectacular, but it appears the Ross Lyon game plan, the things he's instilled at St Kilda already, it's already starting to deliver as they've beaten two finalists from last year in uh, Fremantle, of course, and now the Western Bulldogs. And the way they d- dispatch the Bulldogs is the impressive part as well. Their pressure was was fantastic. I think a lot of the, the midfield stats were fairly even. Um, I think the Bulldogs' midfield contributors were statistically about as prolific as they usually are, Um, but either way, St Kilda really put it away on the scoreboard. And you factor in, they did this without Max King in the side uh, and no Tim Membry still as well, but they found other avenues to goal. This Machito Owens kid has a real talent about him, particularly some forward craft as well, which I don't remember being a feature of his when he got drafted, but I, I could be wrong on that. But either way, he's been really good. He's had five goals in the two games that he's played so far. And of course, young draftee Philippou uh, came in and kicked three goals as sort of marking forward. Um, uh, eventually, he'll move into the midfield, but if he can hit the scoreboard in the absence of other you know, key forward targets, um, that's a real win for St. Hilda. A couple of goals also went to some recruits in uh, Cordy and Caminiti, and Gresham also kicked two. So the, the fact that St. Hilda were able to kick a winning score without so much forward line talent in their side, uh, that's a real, real plus for them, and it speaks to a good system. And for the Dogs, this result is really concerning. It's not so much that they lost to a side in the St. Kilda who was looking pretty decent. It's the fact that they've looked really poor so far uh, in both games. Obviously, getting dispatched by Melbourne, we were able to overlook that when it's Melbourne. And uh, Melbourne also kicked away late in that game. But to only kick, what, six goals in this game? Was it 5-11 or 6-5? I'm not sure. But either way, uh, they looked a little bit impotent in this game. And uh, they are certainly looking a long way off the pace in terms of making finals this year. But it is a long season. That being said, they've got a tough game uh, against the Lions in round three. The Lions look pretty good in round two. Um, We'll talk about that game when we preview it later in the week. But 
This is almost season on the line stuff for the dogs. If they start 0-3, it's going to be very tough to break into a top eight, which is, uh, it's going to be, there's a lot of contenders for it this year. The other game on Saturday night was Fremantle versus North Melbourne. And of course, much has been said about this game known as Siren Gate 2.0, of course, involving Fremantle again. Uh, so we won't labor on that too much. Of course, North Melbourne winning by one point is the main takeaway from this result. Uh, it was a controversial ending, to be honest. Uh, obviously, I, I said at the time on, um, on Instagram, I think it was, that uh, it probably should have been a free for deliberate. It looked as though a siren had gone after the ball had passed the line, but I, I later found out somebody made a good point that when you hear it on the broadcast, it's a little bit later than it actually sounded in reality. And at the end of the day, it's the umpire's call. So I think that's all that needs to be said on that. Uh, to be honest, Fremantle fans, I think, have taken this result fairly well. I think they're more frustrated at the fact that they were in that position in the first place, let alone the fact that they were robbed. So I think there's bigger issues at Fremantle at the moment, and I think their fans realize that. But we'll start with what's good at North Melbourne. And the three players that I mentioned last week when they beat West Coast, all featured again heavily. Harry Sheasel was great again, obviously playing a bit of an unaccountable role at the moment, but still looks very confident for an 18-year-old. LDU, though, could be winning the brown low at the moment. Uh, this guy is one of the best midfielders in the competition on current form. Obviously, he's got to sustain it. But I thought he was really, really prolific. He had 11 clearances along with 30 touches and a goal. And uh, obviously, Nick Larkey as well kicked four goals. So he's winning the Coleman at the moment. And uh, pretty good pretty good opportunistic key forward as well. Kicks goals from uh, half chances as well. So fantastic win on the road for North Melbourne. It really does validate them, um, you know, but when they beat West Coast, a lot of the narrative, including from myself as a West Coast fan, was, gee, West Coast suck. But we have to also acknowledge now they've just beaten a finalist from last year in Perth, a tough ask. Will they make finals? It's a tough ask at this moment, but they're not looking that far off the pace. So well done to them. And Clarkson looks like he's got a, a pretty good formula happening at the Brews after you know one of their worst seasons possibly ever last year. Uh, but from a Fremantle perspective... It was a great fight back, yes, but again, the avenues to gold continues to be a problem. They kicked three late ones. Uh, O'Meara kicked a couple. Maybe that's something they tinker with, I'm not sure. But to that point, they'd only kicked seven goals after only kicking seven goals last week. So there's much has been said about midfield mix. A lot have been said about lack of key forward targets. I think it's just the the connection between the midfield and the forward line is what's breaking down at the moment. And admittedly, perhaps they've been exposed by two very, very good tactical coaches in Lyon and Clarkson. I, uh, that's about as good an analysis I have for you right now. Uh, obviously, I'll watch them closer next week when they play my boys. But uh, there's a little real area of concern for Fremantle. Still, obviously... A good chance to play finals, but when they were, I'm sure, internally hoping top four and beyond this year, at 0-2, they've, they've put themselves behind the eight ball. So the Derby now becomes a must-win game, and we'll talk about that later in the week. Then we'll talk about two of the three Sunday games. Of course, I will talk about the Eagles in a separate video, um, as will be the format going forward. So two games to go. Sydney and Hawthorne, this game went more or less as we expected. Of course, Hawthorne have a bit of a knack for beating Sydney uh, lately, but I think from this result, they ended up losing by 81 points, of course. This is a concerning start to the year for Hawthorne, and I know that we don't expect them to be a finals contender as such. I know some people did, uh, but I considered them a wooden spoon favorite. And uh, at the moment, I think the way they've gotten battered is uh, is not ideal considering, you know, but for a few late goals, this, this game was nearly 100 points. So in terms of the midfield battle, they did okay. I think I highlighted the midfield as too young at the start of the year, but individually, you know, there were some good performances. Newcomb had 25 touches and five clearances and Will Day transitioning into the midfield. He had seven clearances as well, which is really impressive. Um, so it's a young midfield. They did okay in the midfield battle in isolation, but you know, in terms of polish, in terms of just ball movement in general, Sydney were all over them. And, and Sydney are possibly up there with Collingwood as the, the form side of the competition right now. So again, how much do we take from that? But it's not just this loss. They did lose to Essendon by 10 goals or whatever it was last week. So, again, uncompetitive start to the year for Hawthorne. Their percentage after two games is 42%. And I think it's going to be a long year, and I don't think this will be the last bashing that they cop. For the Swans, how much do you take out of a big win against who is, in my opinion, the wooden spoon favorite? Well, I think you can take a few things. Amadi had four goals um, as a key forward target in the absence of Buddy Franklin, who got suspended. And Logan McDonald, one of my favorite young players, kicked five goals as well. So it wasn't tough opposition, but it looks like they at least have a contingency plan for when Buddy's going to be out of the side permanently. So, so either way, a good win for the Swans and uh, a potentially important uh, percentage boost when you consider how the ladder is going to shape up at the end of the year. 
And the final game I'll talk about in this video is Essendon, who dispatched the Gold Coast Suns by 28 points. Dispatch is probably harsh. It was even at three-quarter time, but at the end of the day, the better side won. Uh, this is an important four points, I guess, when you consider these two sides were relatively evenly matched. I think I predicted Gold Coast to finish higher than Essendon this year, but on form so far, the Dons have had a really good start to their, uh, their life under Brad Scott. It was a good game of footy. The lead changed eight times, um, but of course, the Dons pulled away late. And uh, I think one of the big positive sparks for them is uh, Kyle Langford kicked five goals in their forward line. And when you consider they were missing Wright, Stringer, and Wiedemann, who was, I think, a laid out for this game, and then, of course, Tipper, who got injured, those are four, arguably, four of their most important avenues to go. So for Langford to go forward, he missed a lot of footy last year from memory, uh, and kick five goals, that's a really good start. Whether it's a permanent move... Maybe. I think when they have all their pieces back, it'll be interesting to see where he fits in. But either way, that's a, a really good role played by Kyle Langford in this game. I think the form of Setterfield as well as a big-bodied midfielder, adding something different to their midfield mix is also really encouraging. He had one goal in 28 possessions. We saw Zach Merritt play well, Shield, um, and also Darcy Parrish. So these guys, as usual, were really productive in the midfield. For the Gold Coast Suns, Tuke Miller, as you'd expect, was very, very... Um, prominent with 31 disposals, and Raul also had 10 clearances in this game, which is worth noting. But it was probably too much left to too few in this game. And while it was an improved performance on their round one performance against uh, Sydney, where they got battered, definitely an improvement. But they are now 0-2 and, and look a long way off the finals mix when you consider Essendon are certainly not considered a lock for finals by any stretch. So... It's a poor start to the year, but there's plenty of time to regroup and make progress. All right, guys, that is all my thoughts on the round two set of games and all the action that took place. Let me know what you think I missed or what was something that you took out of round two. What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Uh, and of course, stay tuned for Druzy's nine things I learned this week, as well as the footy tips podcast. And um, we're going to do a derby preview this week as well and potentially more videos working through a crazy life at the moment, uh, but it's all fun and games and I'm happy to be here. So thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.